Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I am here for my 2022 LCS offseason review and analysis video. Uh, you guys really enjoyed these videos last year that I did on all of the roster changes in both the LCS and the LEC. So I think I'm going to be doing that again this year, with this year's offseason being one of the more interesting ones that we have gotten in many, many, many years. I'm very, very excited. I have a lot of opinions to talk about in this video. Um, first, I guess I'll address the elephant in the room. Uh, I haven't uploaded in quite a while if you're a longtime fan of the channel. Uh, it's been since about midway through last season that I stopped uploading. And um, I, I just got a little overwhelmed with the work. Um, as you guys know, I do make the graphics, uh, I produce the voiceover, I, I write the script, I do everything for the channel, obviously, uh, and doing that alongside school and a full-time job as well was just getting to be a little bit too much. Um, right now I've got a little bit of free time, so I really did want to make these kinds of videos, but if you guys do enjoy my content, please let me know down in the description, or the comment section, I should say, because, uh, this is something I really do enjoy doing. And if there is some support or if there is some sort of uh, <laughs> desire for these kinds of videos that I have made over the past year out there, uh, I'll definitely consider doing more. Um, you know, I was thinking about doing an update video, but I think doing it here is probably just for the better. But for those of you who are new to the channel, hi, my name is Kyle. Uh, I've been watching Professional League of Legends for, what, 11 years now? Uh, 11 to 10 years. Uh, and... I have followed the LCS, the LEC, the LCK, and the LPL uh, very, very strongly over that time period. Um, I'm by no means some sort of unbelievable expert, but uh, I feel like I have a lot to offer in terms of, I don't think a lot of people out there watch a lot of the games like I do in every single region. That includes things like Academy. I think I have a, a pretty interesting perspective, so I'm going to be going over that today. I'm going to be going through all 10 LCS teams here today, uh, going over what their roster was last year and then how they went and either improved or downgraded on that roster going into 2022. If you guys are excited, please go ahead and leave a like. And like I said, if you guys are interested in this kind of content or pretty much any kind of content, Go ahead and leave that down in the comment section below. Um, but without further ado, I don't want to waste too much time. We're almost three minutes into this video already. Let's go ahead and jump into the team that finished first in the LCS last year. Your LCS champion, 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves, I should say. Um, now, what you're seeing up on the screen right now is the graphic that I am using uh, to portray how the offseason went. You're going to see the team name in the middle with their record from last year with both spring and summer combined, as well as how they finished in the summer playoffs listed next to that. You'll see their 2021 roster on the left, their 2022 on the right. You will also see a grade next to each player. This grade represents uh, my opinion of what that player's value is across the league. This isn't necessarily perfectly correlated to how good a player is right now. I think a player can have higher value than their talent would suggest if they offer something a little bit more lucrative. We'll see that a little bit later with some NA endemic players being rated a little bit higher in terms of the grade because they don't cost that valuable import slot. So um, if you have arguments about that, uh, of course, I love talking to you guys down in the comments section. I love having that conversation, so let's just keep it civil, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to debate over anything that I put up on this screen. But let's talk about 100 Thieves. Um, they are unchanged. The LCS champions, they went to Worlds last year, and they looked okay. Um, they were in a really, really tough group. Obviously, getting saddled with um, you know two of the best teams in the world, ADG and T1, um, are, you know, it's a tough draw. It's a tough draw, um, and I think overall they looked okay. I don't think they looked particularly bad. I think at points they looked bad. I think at points they looked good. Um, I think your big takeaways from last year are the emergence of the young core, and the young core I'm talking about is Closer and then FBI. I think those two really stepped up and became the focal point for this 100 Thieves team. Uh, they were really, really good. I think you can make a strong case that Closer got robbed for the MVP of Summer last year, although I totally understand giving it to Spica as well. 
Um, but we'll go through the positions. Uh, not too much to talk about. We'll talk about top lane first because it's probably the most interesting conversation to have with the team. You'll see I do have Someday listed here as your 2022 starter in the top lane. That's because he will probably play a majority of the games, but they are doing a six-man roster with Tenacity coming up from 100 Academy. And I think that's a really good idea. I think Tenacity is a very, very good player. I think he is super LCS ready. I think him and Kenvi both could have had starting spots in the LCS this year if they were willing to go to maybe a, a you know a less prestigious team. I'm sure CLG was a team that was reaching out and asking them, but um, you know they wanted to bet on themselves. They think they can be a starter for one of the top tier organizations in North America, and and I frankly agree. Um, maybe that's not right now, but but in the future, I think that that's that's totally possible. Um, but. It is going to be someday for now. I think he's going to play the majority of the games, especially in spring. I do think he is the better player. Uh, someday had a little bit of a drop-off of a year last year. Uh, he wasn't quite as dominant as in lane, especially as he's been uh, since coming over to NA. But I think a lot of that has to do with just resources being allocated elsewhere. In my opinion, he's always been the premier weak side top laner in North America. Uh, he just can find ways to gain gold advantages without even really having any sort of resources dedicated to him. And I think that is one of the most valuable assets in all of League of Legends. And I think there, that's a reason that I, I've always considered someday one of the better players in LCS. Uh, I think he fits his role perfectly on this team. I think Tenacity, you know, it, it, a little bit of a similar vein, a little bit better with resources, I'd say, than someday is, but probably not quite as good on the weak side. Um... I think both of these players are going to function in their particular roles. I think we're going to see a little bit of a sword and shield dynamic, kind of similar to what we saw with Cloud9 uh, many, many years ago, I believe like 2017 with Impact and Ray when they had both of those on the roster. I think someday is going to be a more consistent uh, weak side player where tenacity you kind of put in if you want to start giving resources up to that top side if the meta starts to favor it. Um, but then we can move down to Jungle. Jungle, of course, being Closer. Closer was phenomenal last year. Uh, this was a guy that I was hyping up really, really heavily going into 2021. He had a phenomenal year on Golden Guardians the year before, and uh, he really came through. He was fantastic last year for Thieves, um, and I don't expect that to change. I think his play style is very, very hit or miss. I think there are going to be games where he absolutely dominates, and I think that's going to be a majority of his games. But, I, of course, he's not going to be the most consistent jungler in the world either. He does have problems. He can be a little over-aggressive, especially on invades. Um, and that did cost him a little bit at times. But his talent and, quite frankly, the talent in his lanes around him uh, allow him to play so aggressively and allow him to push up and invade like that so often that I don't really see that coming to bite him too often. I expect him to be a top contender for MVP again this year. Uh, Abadage in the mid lane was actually their mid-season addition from Schalke, um, and he was really, really good coming over. I think a lot of people are going to be upset that I only have him as a B plus here. I think there are going to be some people that consider him an A grade mid laner. Um, I'm not of that camp. I think Abadage is a really good player. I think he's easily top three mid laner in North America, but I don't necessarily think he's that needle mover quite in the same way that players like Bjergsen and Jensen for their teams have been in the past. Not saying either of them are that now but the way that those players have been for their organizations in the past. Um, I think Abadag is a good player, and I think he fits this team really well. Him and Closer seem to have a really good dynamic. Obviously, they played together many, many moons ago in Turkey, and uh, that synergy has clearly maintained throughout the years as they looked really, really good once he came over in summer last year. Uh, a big reason why they won the LCS in 2021 was because of Abadag. And so I, I'm, I'm definitely for keeping him together. And then you have what was probably the best bot lane in North America last year, FBI and Huhi in the bottom lane and support, respectively, I should say. Um, they are really, 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 really good. Um, both of them are two of the best mechanical players at their position in the region. And they've proven that over and over again. Their dominance in lane is... Uh, unparalleled, who he's team fighting is phenomenal. FBI is getting better in that aspect every day. While that may not be his strong suit, um, I definitely think he's getting better at it. Um, these guys are just really, really tough to deal with. You have to spend resources in order to shut down this bottom lane. If you leave them 2v2, they are going to get an advantage almost every single time. Um, so overall, I think this team has a lot of really good pieces, really good uh, things going for it. I'm not necessarily sure that they are in a position to be considered favorites to run it back. Um, and obviously, this isn't a power rankings video. I will do that 
later in the off season when I have a little bit more time to gather, you know, a lot of my thoughts and, and really put things into perspective. But I think if you're 100 Thieves, kind of the point of this off season was keep the gang together. You have a lot of young guns and tenacity. You have Kenvi. Um, you know, you sold some of your young guns and Luger and Poom, but promoted a few others. You bring in Wixie. I think you, you, you have this pipeline that's really rolling along and I think you don't want to rock the boat too much. Um, and I think that's exactly what they did is they, you know, everything's the same at the high level. The low level is still churning along. You have one of the best, if not the best academy system in North America. Um, things are going well for thieves. Small shout out here. Uh, I have to point it out just because it happened. They did go ahead and sign General Sniper to their amateur team. General Sniper, for those who aren't aware, is, I believe, 15. I believe he just turned 15. Uh, and he is amazing. He has been number one on the North American ladder for uh, a couple of years now, uh, over many times. Um, he seems to be that next generation's superstar. Um, hopefully the one that can bring NA some sort of success is what everybody's hoping. And 100 Thieves were actually able to pick him up in the offseason for their amateur team. That's going to be incredible to watch. I hope he can grow and develop with the organization and hopefully take over at some point. But as for now, I think what they have is really good, and I I, I can't fault the direction Thieves are going every offseason because it always seems like they have that plan. And so I'm going to trust in them until they prove me otherwise. That's going to go ahead and bring us to our second place team, our other finalist from the 2021 season, and that is going to be Team Liquid. Now, if you've been following the offseason at all, you guys will know that Team Liquid went out and made some moves this offseason. Uh, they were a good team last year, but this might be the best team on paper that NA has ever seen. Um, I will quickly go over what their roster for 2022 is looking like. Um, you've got Whippo in the top lane, Santorin in the jungle, Bjergsen coming out of retirement to play mid lane, Hansama as the AD carry, and then Core JJ as the support. One thing I didn't point out, as I'm sure you guys can already see uh, in my 100 Thieves section because it wasn't prevalent, is in the middle, uh, by the way, between the 2020, 2021 and the 2022 uh, years, you're going to see... Um, how I consider an upgrade, a downgrade, an unchanged, you know, uh, sometimes it will just say change, which means that it's kind of a neutral one to me. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I wouldn't take too much into that. Uh, this is definitely in a micro sense and not so much a macro sense. So, for example, you can see that Alfari is considered better than Whippo. I have Alfari as an A grade. I have Whippo as a B plus grade, uh, which some people are going to get mad is way too low. And I get it. I understand, but I'll talk about it. Um, I consider Whippo to personally be a downgrade to Alfari as a player. Um, I don't think that this team is necessarily going to be worse for having Whippo than they would be for having Alfari. But in a micro sense of Alfari versus Whippo, I think Alfari is a little bit of a better player. That's just a little bit of an explanation as to what goes into those specific grades. Um, nothing that is too, too serious. But let's go ahead and talk about how this team did last year. Uh, this team was very inconsistent last year, obviously. Uh, a lot of roster turnover throughout the year. Alfari was in and out of the starting lineup. Santorin was in and out of the starting lineup, notably missing the spring finals. Uh, he seems to be doing a lot better now, which is good. If everything's good to go on that front, then I think that's really solid. Um, the big news here is the super team, obviously. Uh, bringing in two of Europe's most famous players, some of their best, in Whippo in the top lane and Hansama in the bottom lane, I think is huge for this Team Liquid team, specifically Hansama. I want to talk about Hansama. I do truly believe that Hansama is the best AD carry in the West. I don't think there's really much of a debate. Um, I, I honestly don't even know who you would put up against Hansama. Perhaps someone like Upset. Perhaps, you know, if, if you're talking to me, someone like Patrick. But, you know, um, a lot of people are going to disagree with that one. Um, I think Hansam was fantastic. I think he's proven over the past few years that he is one of the most mechanically talented and smart AD carries out there. He's good in lane. I wouldn't say he's dominant in lane, but he is a phenomenal team fighter. He is really, really good at turning disadvantageous states into advantageous states for his team, which I think is a valuable resource that a lot of people don't talk about. And it's definitely one we don't see very often. In the AD carry position, I do think he's going to be a pretty big upgrade over tactical. Uh, tactical obviously being 
one of NA's big young stars. I think he's going to be a very good player. I don't think he's ever going to be the level that Han Sama is right now. And I think if you're if you're Team Liquid and you're looking to win, I think this is a good move. Um, the other big move, obviously, from Europe was bringing in Bwipo in the top lane. Uh, he is roll-swapping back to the top lane after playing the uh, back half, the summer split of uh, 2021 with Fnatic as a jungler uh, to make room for Adam. I think that, obviously, Bwipo's main role is top lane. We've seen him dominate on that role in the past. We've seen him be one of the best top laners in the world, a world finalist in the top lane, if we want to be very specific. But... I'm not entirely sure that that is the same Bwipo that we are getting in 2022. Don't get me wrong. I think Bwipo is a really good player, and I think he will easily be one of the better top laners in North America. I think I'm just maybe saying to hamper some expectations on him being some lane dominant top that, that pulls out these crazy picks kind of like he did three or four years ago. I don't think that's necessarily his game plan anymore, and especially with the team that he has. I'm not necessarily sure that that's going to be the priority. I don't think playing through top is really going to be something that this team looks to do quite a lot because you do have Han Sama down in the bot lane. Uh, another guy who's traditionally not gotten a ton of resources, but I think with this team, it's going to be a lot more likely. Um, I think Whipple obviously is a really, really good player. And I think considering what the options were out there, I think this is probably the best option that you could have gotten outside of maintaining Alfari, just in terms of mechanical skill in the top lane. However, I think you could definitely make the argument that Whippo is a better fit for this roster than Alfari would be. Um, although, you know, I'm not going to say that's entirely true one way or the other. Uh, I think the argument is just there to be made. Um, you're retaining two of your biggest glue pieces. Um, you're retaining Santorin in the jungle, who I think is perennially underrated as a player. I think he is actually very, very good. And I think he proved that at Worlds this past year where he was pretty consistently out jungling a lot of the opposition uh, in what was a very tough group. Um, you know, going up against Gen.G and going up against LNG uh, and even Mad Lions, you know, <laughs> Mad Lions towards the end, I should say, uh, maybe not towards the beginning of the tournament, but um, he looked very good. He looked not lost at all. And I think that's a really good sign for Santorin, who has traditionally not really shown up at an international level in the past. I think this was his, by far his best world championship. I think it's a good sign. Uh, Santorin is the new Xmithy. And, you know, you could take that however you want. Um, some people are going to take that as an insult. Some people are going to take that as a compliment. Santorin is the ultimate glue piece as a jungler for a super team. And I think that's exactly what this team needs. He's a very unselfish player who likes to play for his lanes, likes to get them ahead, and will sacrifice a little bit of his own resources to do so. And I think... You know, in this in this kind of meta, in this kind of state, I think that can be really, really advantageous. Um, but moving over to the second piece that they retained, we have to talk about Core JJ. First of all, I will say this is all contingent on Core actually getting his visa uh, before the beginning of the season because if he doesn't, he's still considered an import and he won't be able to play because that will be three imports. Um, so I'll quickly say about Ayla. Ayla is a good player. He's not Core JJ. Um, this team will struggle without Core in, in a way that they wouldn't with him. Uh, I'm not saying they'd be a bad team or even a team that's not one of the best. What I'm saying is I think losing Core uh, would have an effect on this team, especially early. But let's talk as if Core is going to have that visa as soon as possible, which is looking to be more likely by the day. Core is one of the two players in all of LCS that I consider an A-plus asset. I think he is that good. Um, I think he just offers something to your team that other players don't. He's the best player in LCS. Um, he is very, you know, famous for popularizing the roaming support play style that has basically taken over the LCS over the past year. Um, but he is the only one who has really brought it to any level of consistent success. Uh, I think Core is just unbelievable. His laning phase is really good when he wants to go for those 2v2 plays. It, it does almost always work out. He has great timing with that, but... His roams are extraordinary. He is everywhere across the map. His synergy with Santorin was really, really good last year, and I expect that to continue in 2022. And then we get to move into the big news this offseason, and that is mid laner Bjergsen, the greatest player in LCS history, coming out of retirement, the former coach for TSM, coming back to the mid lane to play for arch rival Team Liquid. I think it's awesome. 
I think you could say what you want about, you know, where we think Bjergsen's going to be at. I'm just going to quickly touch upon, this is great. And as a fan of LCS, this is one of the coolest things that I've seen happen in a few years. I think this is a phenomenal story. This, this is a phenomenal story, and I'm just excited to see where it goes. I cannot wait for TSM versus Team Liquid because the hype on that match is going to be unbelievable. But let's talk about how Bjergsen fits into this team. Bjergsen, obviously traditionally a more supportive mid laner that is willing to give up resources in order to enable his teammates, at least when he's been at his best. And I think that works here. I think you could really make an argument that this team is maybe a little too supportive. Players like Santorin, players like uh, Bjergsen, Core JJ, none of them are really carry-oriented players. I think the onus is going to fall a lot onto Hansama this season in, in order to be that team's hyper carry. They, it, you know, in my opinion, it looks like they're going to play a lot through bottom lane. And I definitely think he has the talent to capitalize on that kind of uh, exposure to, to take all those resources. But, um, you know, he, he hasn't necessarily been put in a position where he's had to do that before. So we're going to have to see just how exactly that works out. I think overall... Uh, this is a huge upgrade to their 2021 team that I already thought was really good. Most people are considering them favorites to win the LCS. Uh, I would have to lightly agree. Um, this team on paper might be the strongest that this region has ever seen. That's going to go ahead and bring us to our third place finisher from the 2021 season, our last Worlds representative from 2021, and that is going to be Cloud9. Now, Cloud9 is the talk of the town this offseason for many reasons, but before we get into that, let's go ahead and go over what their 2022 roster is looking like. In the top lane, they bring in Summit from the LCK, from Live Sandbox. In the jungle, it's going to be Blabber. Mid lane, you have Fudge roll swapping from top to mid. The bottom lane, you've got Berserker coming in from T1 Academy. And then at the support, you've got Isles, also kind maybe Winsome, uh, another player coming in from the LCK. That is to be determined. I have Isles listed here as I think he's most likely going to be the starter week one at least. Um, this team is incredibly interesting. I didn't even get to coach. I think that's the big reason that this team is so interesting is the new coach of Cloud9 is, of course, LS. And uh, if you guys aren't familiar with LS, I'm kind of surprised that you found my channel before you found his. But um, I'll say this quickly. I think it's fantastic that LS is coaching Cloud9, whether you like him, whether you don't. One of the most divisive figures in the entire uh, industry, <laughs> really, in the entire scene. I think it's phenomenal that he is coaching Cloud9. Someone who's been really outspoken about draft and about how uh, things should go down in terms of coaching, finally gets a chance to put that into action on one of the biggest stages in the world. And I think that can do nothing but great things for us as fans. You know, whether you like him, whether you don't, you get to cheer for him or you get to cheer against him. I think this is, this is phenomenal. So I'm really, really excited to see where Cloud9 goes this year. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the roster moves. Um, we'll start first with the players that are retaining, which is really just two, uh, kind of three, but we'll talk about two. The first one I want to talk about is Blabber, who is, other than Core JJ, the only other player in North America that I have listed with an A-plus grade. I think Blabber is that valuable. Um, whether you want to say that he's that good, which I do, uh, I, I do want to say that he is that good, um, but what, you know, obviously there are a lot of people out there that don't seem to share that sentiment with Blabber that he is some, you know, world-class jungler, like I tend to believe. I, I think you have to agree that he is easily the best endemic North American player in the LCS, you know, until Court JJ gets that visa. And I think that alone gives him tremendous value. He's incredibly young, but he's also experienced. He's played multiple times at international events to both success and failure. Um, and he's dominated the regional league you know, multiple years over at this point. So uh, Blabber for me is an A plus grade jungler. To me, he is the best jungler in the LCS. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I definitely think there's an argument to be made there with a few other players that we'll talk about. But to me, Blabber is the number one jungler in the LCS. And I think he is an asset to any organization that he's a part of, let alone Cloud9. I think he's going to mesh very well with this team. But moving on to the other player that was retained, it's still a little bit of a story here, and that's going to be Fudge 
in the mid lane now. Uh, he was a top laner last year, and he was really good um, in lane last year. Um, and I'm just I'm interested to see where this goes for Fudge. Um, obviously, Fudge with his connections to LS is going to be a big part of the game planning, I think, for this roster. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think having a player switch to a new position, you want him to feel comfortable. And uh, I think that is exactly what is going to happen here with Cloud9. I think Fudge is going to be put in a position where he's not going to have to do anything that is too unremarkable uh, some, or out of his comfort zone, I should say. Um, I thought he was good last year. I think his performance was maybe a little bit overhyped. I think people are forgetting some of the down points that he had throughout the year. I still think he was one of the better top laners in North America. The B plus grade, I think, says that. I think, it, you know, if, if you're somebody who's like, I can't believe he doesn't have an A grade, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I did, you know, maybe he will this year as a mid laner. I'm just, I'm not super sold on the idea of him being an A mid laner without ever having seen it. Um, I think it's listed as a downgrade here from perks and an upgrade in the top lane, which I feel is kind of, you know, it feels like an attack to fudge. That wasn't my intention here. I think, unfortunately for Fudge, uh, or fortunately, however you want to say it, he's just gotten the chance to play with two world-class players at both positions uh, in Perks last year in the mid lane, and then this year, bringing in Summit in the top lane, who, uh, in my opinion, comes in day one as the best top laner in North America. Summit has been perennially underrated by LCK fans for many, many, many years because he's been on Live Sandbox and nobody watches Sandbox, but... Um, I think he's really, really talented. I think he's going to stomp laning phases. I think he's tremendous in team fights. I really don't think there is any flaw in Summit's game that we are going to see really have any sort of major issues with. Um, so I can't, it's, it's hard for me to really talk up Summit, um, because I feel like everyone already knows that he's just going to be fantastic. Um, and if you don't already know, you're going to see it very quickly. He's just a different kind of player. This is, to me is very akin to Someday coming over uh, back in 2017, I want to say, when he came over to Dignitas as a guy who I think a lot of people had forgotten about as one of the best players in the LCK at his position. Coming over, and uh, from moment one, Someday dominated, I think it's going to be very, very similar to Summit. Um, and I think Cloud9 is going to be the better off for it. Um, but let's talk about the other LCK import as well here in Berserker, someone that I think a lot of people... Uh, are going to know less about uh, than even Summit. Berserker obviously playing in T1's academy team. They're um, kind of they're part of that pipeline that just seems to be never-ending for T1. Um, Berserker's really good. Uh, I've checked out, uh, you know, almost all of his games from last year that I can at this point. Um, and, and man, Berserker is a good player. Um, people are comparing him a lot to Gumiyushi, and I can definitely see it. I think he definitely has that kind of impact. Um, this is really the first time in quite a while that we've seen a young Korean player, a player uh, coming from the academy scene in Korea, come over to North America before they've really had a chance to do anything in the LCK. And I think it's going to be interesting. Um, I have it listed as a change from Zven going to Berserker. Uh, I'm not willing to say that minute one it's going to be this giant upgrade because, again, we it, it's just hard for me to say that when we've never seen Berserker play in a major league. But I think very likely, uh, as the grade indicates, by the at least probably the end of spring, he is going to outpace what Zven was giving you. Uh, last year, uh, I was pretty down on Zven. Um, and, you know, luckily for Cloud9, uh, they actually retained Zven in their academy uh, which is huge, because if Berserker doesn't work out, you can always just flip those two, and I think that's that's pretty massive. They actually have a pretty good academy team, you could maybe argue, the best. So, um, overall, you know, I think the addition of Berserker is a really good idea, and it's going to be really interesting to see how it works out. Uh, and, of course, with the fallback plan, I just think everything is in place here for Cloud9. We'll talk about support last year, because I think it's the least important. You are promoting Isles from your academy team last year. Isles is a good player. Um, I don't think he's some sort of transcendent, uh, like, prospect, but I think he's on the same level that a few other uh, high-level supports from Academy have been in the past, players like Diamond, and even other roles players this year, like Jenkins, players like Poom and Luger, I think are very similar in terms of skill here to uh, Isles. 
I don't think he's going to be a detriment to this team. However, if there is a weak link on this roster, it is definitely going to be Isles. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they really wanted to get rid of Vulcan. Uh, Vulcan, to me, is fantastic. One of the best supports in the West. And uh, I, I maybe it was a, a contract money thing. Maybe they just didn't have any plans for him. Maybe they felt they were better off with Isles and Winsome. Uh, but, you know, Vulcan leaving here I do think is a downgrade, and I do think it's a miss. I think um, so far with the first two teams that we talked about in 100 Thieves and Team Liquid, I didn't really mention any sort of misses in terms of where the organization's head was at, in my opinion, but I think this to me is a miss. Uh, however, Cloud9 has done this in the past over and over and over again, where it seems like they're selling players when they really shouldn't. You know, you look at Licorice, you look at Contracts, um, you know, I'm sure there, I'm sure there are others that I'm just forgetting off the top of my head because I'm always wrong. Um, and, uh, maybe Vulcan falls into this category of someone who at the time were like, how could you possibly get rid of him? And then we look back on Sven Skarin's another one. I didn't mention Sven Skarin, but Sven Skarin's another one. How could you get rid of them at the time? And then you look back on it. It's like they sold at the exact right time. They knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, maybe that's going to be the same for Vulcan. However, I think Vulcan is probably a little bit better than those other guys were, um, just naturally. Um, and I think we're going to see that with him still going to a pretty good team this year. Isles has some big shoes to fill. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to fill it immediately, but uh, overall, I still think Cloud9 is a very good roster. I think this team definitely should be contending for an LCS title. Are they going to make it? I am not sure. Are they even a Worlds team? That I'm also not convinced of. I think a lot has to be proven to me with this roster, but you know, if you're not entertained, if you're not interested, if you're not going to be watching... Uh, you're crazy because this is probably the most entertaining team to follow in 2022. Now we get to talk about the team that I have been waiting to talk about for many moons now, and that is going to be the fourth place finishers from 2021 Evil Geniuses. Now this has got to be my favorite team in LCS for all transparency and bias sake. Uh, this is your North American representative, uh, however you want to put it. Obviously, the meme surrounding the LCS this year is uh, it's worlds, but in one region. And here you've got your North American rep in Evil Geniuses. So we'll, let's first go ahead and run down their roster for 2022. Starting in the top lane, it's going to be Impact. In the jungle is Inspired coming over from the LEC. In the mid lane, Jojo Pune, which I'll get to that. Uh, your bot laner is Danny, and your support is Vulcan coming in from Cloud9. Wow, 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 wow. I'm usually not so... I, I, I try not to fawn over things on this channel in terms of ideas and execution, but it's really, really hard not to just praise what Evil Geniuses has done this offseason. And again, like I said, for full transparency, I hope this roster wins the league. I hope that this roster goes to Worlds and does well because, man, would that, would that just, I feel like that would just be so good for North American League of Legends if a team like this really, really worked and if the players in it worked out. But let's go ahead and talk about why I feel that way. Let's go ahead and talk about Impact in the top lane first. Uh, I actually think Impact is coming off what was probably the best year of his career. Um, I think you can maybe make arguments that obviously his T1 days were better, but as for NA, I'm not sure there are a ton of arguments to be made that he had any better years than what he had in 2021. He was finally given resources by this team and he came through. He really, really, really came through with that. Um, actually playing really, really well, uh, especially once, uh, Danny came in and had a little bit more of that team fight presence. A lot of those early resources were dictated to the top lane and impact, I thought, uh, really, really showed out with it, really raised my stock of him as a player. And I think uh, a lot of people might still think of Impact as that tank weak side player that he was a couple of years ago or that he was maybe pigeonholed into being a couple of years ago. That is not who Impact is. Uh, Impact is one of the best top laners in the West, uh, period, full stop. He is that good. And I think he's proven that, uh, especially after last year. Then let's go ahead and talk about the jungler. You are bringing in Inspired, the spring MVP for the LEC last year, coming from Rogue. 
Uh, this is a huge get. Um, as you can see, he has an A grade for me. He was phenomenal for Rogue. And, um, you know, I, I think that A grade might be a little high if it really were my opinion. But uh, I do think the way he is valued around the league is definitely seen as an A. I think he is considered a must-get for a lot of teams. And I think Evil Geniuses are going to be incredibly excited that they were able to pull him in to what is probably, uh, looking at the jungle pool in North America, what is probably the deepest position that North America has maybe ever seen is junglers this year. I think Inspired is a big reason for that. He is phenomenal. Earlier, I said the Blabber was the best jungler in the L LCS. I think a lot of people are going to dispute that with Inspired. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting watching those two consistently play off against each other this year too, though. So I think it's a really big upgrade over Sven Skarin, who by the end of last year was just kind of looking fine. Uh, obviously him and Contracts were splitting some time, and we'll talk about Contracts a little bit later. But um, Inspired, I think, is going to offer a lot to this team as... Not, not even just a carry jungler, but a facilitator as well. I think he just plays multiple styles. I think he's really good at the game of League of Legends, and I think he helps this team out a ton. But let's go ahead and get into where most of my excitement is for the Evil Geniuses team, and that's going to be in the mid lane with them bringing in Jojo Pune. Oh my goodness, is this not the greatest thing ever? Um, it's hard for me not to completely just fawn over this decision because... They didn't have to make it, but they made it anyways. Uh, obviously, Jensen, notoriously still a free agent, one of the best mid laners in LCS over the past few years, turned down in favor of promoting JoJo, an endemic 17-year-old North American talent from EG Academy, who really, really dominated the Academy scene last year. I absolutely love, love this move. I think JoJo is going to be a stellar player. And I think it's going to, you know, the fingers crossed that JoJo can turn out to be everything that that people like me are hyping him up to be. And he, you know, kind of changes the way North American teams look at addressing roster situations. I think EG is taking a big risk here, going on a younger talent instead of a proven one. And I think it's kind of been ballyhooed and, and, and you know, uh, criticized a lot by, you know, fans. And uh, I think if, if something like this were to work out, maybe the stigma around promoting younger talent instead of just relying on the same names over and over again might be a little bit improved. Um, that being said, JoJo as a player is incredibly aggressive. This is exactly what you want to see out of a young player who wants to earn his spot. He has one some of the best laning mechanics that I think I've seen in the mid lane in, in North America, at least in a very long time. Uh, he consistently wins lane against, he at least he did at the academy level uh, with almost no effort. He was that much better than everyone else he was playing against. Um, he still is a pretty good team fighter, but his he, he he plays to me a lot like the Chovy of Academy, which was kind of what he was. He was the Chovy of Academy last year, where he was just so much better than everybody else that it was really, really tough to identify where he could improve or exactly, you know, how much he contributed because he was just better. You know, what, what, are, what are his decision making skills? I don't know because he always had a 30 CS lead. You know, um, so that's going to be really interesting to see this year. If he can, if he can maintain that level of of dominance in terms of mechanical skill uh, at the LCS level, I, I the sky is the absolute limit for JoJo. Um, obviously, players like Jazuke and Jensen not having teams is very sad. Um, Jazuke especially had a fantastic 2021, and it is sad to see him go teamless after he had probably one of the best years of his career. Jensen as well, obviously coming off of what was maybe the worst year of his career, but still being Jensen, not having a team. It's sad to see those guys not get the shot here, but I, I can't feel anything but optimism surrounding JoJo. And the same for that goes for Danny as well in the bottom lane. Danny was great last year. He was the rookie of the year in the LCS in 2021. Incredibly well-deserved. Very, very good player. Very similar to JoJo in the sense of he is a very aggressive player. The first thing that you're going to notice if you watch a ton of Danny is that he goes for the plays. Um, whether or not they're the right plays all the time, you know, I think you could make the argument for, but um, he is not afraid. And I think that, again, I, I can't stress enough, that is something that I think is incredibly valuable in a young prospect like that. Because I think you can learn 
to play a little bit safer. I don't think you can learn. I don't think you can necessarily learn in the same way to to be the risk taker, to be the one who want that, that to have that drive to win the fight on your own, and win fights on his own. I think he absolutely did in 2021. I think this team around him is significantly better this year too, in the team fighting department. Uh, I, I I think he might be a sneaky contender for MVP of the entire league this year. I think he's that good. I have him listed as an A- minus grade. I was very close to giving him an A grade in general. I think he is going to have a phenomenal year here on Evil Geniuses. Do not be shocked if we're talking about Danny as one of the best AD carries in the West come October of this year. Um, and then we'll move on to Vulcan. Acquiring Vulcan uh, from Cloud9 I think is a good upgrade here to Ignar. I think Ignar is a good player and I think, you know, not to say anything bad about Ignar, he's he's good. He, he is an above average uh, support in LCS. Uh, I think Vulcan is very good. I think Vulcan is a championship level support here. Uh, one, has been easily one of the best supports, if not the best support in North America. Well, I guess other than Core JJ over the past few years. I think it's easy to see why this team really, really wanted to value someone like Vulcan as an endemic player. And uh, they went out and got him. And I think that's actually huge. I cannot wait to see the bottom lane of Danny and Vulcan in action. I think it is going to be one of the best bottom lanes, if not the best bottom lane in North America, uh, very, very early on. And uh, I I'm just excited to see how this team works out. So I've talked enough about how much I love Evil Geniuses. I think for the hope of NA fans, I want this team to, to reach its full potential uh, because if they do, uh, what a culture shock to that landscape it would be. Moving on to our fifth place team from 2021, we're getting to the one everybody wants to hear about, and that is TSM Team Solo Mid, who came in fifth last year and who uh, really did some interesting things with their roster this year that I, I'm actually pretty happy to go over. Uh, but let's go over their roster from top to support. Uh, in the top lane, they're bringing back Huni. In the jungle is Spika. In the mid lane is going to be Kuido, um, who I'm, I'm very excited about. I'll talk about Kuido a little bit later. Um, tactical as the bot laner, and then Shengi as the new support. Um, they went a very interesting direction, one direction that I think no LCS team has really done yet, which I think is, um, you know, I look back on it and I'm quite surprised, but, but really we haven't seen a lot of teams do this yet, and that is invest in young Chinese talent. We've seen a lot of Korean talent be uh, imported over, you know, since 2014, since the Great Korean Exodus. Uh, but, but it's never really been the Chinese market that has been tapped into by NA. That is changing with TSM this year. I think Sword Art was a little bit of a precursor to what we're getting right now. But um, let's go ahead and talk about the two players that stayed from that TSM team last year. Starting with Huni in the top lane, who I'm just kind of not sold on anymore. Um, I think Huni's fine. I think at best he's a mid-tier top laner. Um, he's just, he's not the Huni that we once knew. That is for certain. Um, I'm just not, I'm not on the same level with Huni as I think I, you know, his Echo Fox days are long behind him, uh, longer than that, still his T1 days and then his Immortal days. Um, I, I just, I, this isn't the same Huni that you may remember. And I think that was pretty clear last year when he was just not the best. He's not this huge gaping flaw that I think this team has. I think he's still at least a decent player, but I would definitely not consider him to be one of the more valuable assets in North America. Um, and I don't think if you're a team like TSM, you're super thrilled with bringing him back uh, if you want to contend for a championship this year. However, I as weird as this may sound, I think there is a, a strong case to be made that maybe TSM wasn't looking too hard at 2022 as their all-in year. Sorry about that pause, uh, but uh, let's go ahead and jump into Spika, uh, the jungler who we definitely can't say uh, is is not a win now kind of player, mostly because this is your reigning MVP, uh, and he earned it in summer. He absolutely earned it, uh, carrying TSM to a first place finish in the regular season, a 30 and 15 record. Uh, he was a big reason why this team was good at all last year. Not to say that the rest of the pieces weren't good, but they were really, uh, you know, a, a unit of good players carried by a really, really solid player here in Spika, 
who really came into his own as one of the best junglers in North America. Um, I have his grade maybe a little low here, mostly because I'm not necessarily sure he proved that he was all that he was in the regular season in the playoffs, and that is something I'm definitely a little concerned about, is his playoff performance, but he's still going to be an A-graded player, someone that any organization would love to have inside of their organization, and I think a good piece for TSM to build around for the future, which is exactly what they're doing. Obviously, the meme that Spica wanted to go play in the LPL, so TSM brought the LPL to TSM. Uh, and that's that. That's kind of proving to be true here with their mid laner and their support pickups of Kuaido. Kuaido? 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 Somebody tell me. I think it's Kuaido. I'm pretty sure it's Kuaido. Uh, bringing Kuaido in the mid lane and then Shenyi at support. I think Kuaido is, uh, I, you know, I, I've done extensive research on these two players before making this video. I wasn't particularly familiar with Kuaido. Uh, I did not watch a ton of LDL. Um, but I was familiar with Shenyi from the few games that he did play for FPX in the LPL last year. So we'll talk about Shenyi first. I I'm not particularly high on Shenyi. He had some good Rakan games uh, in the LPL last year. Uh, outside of that, he just seems like a player who doesn't make a ton of mistakes, doesn't make a ton of proactive plays, and that's fine. He seems like a pretty safe player. Um, that might change going into an environment with you know, quite frankly, less skill uh, in the other positions that the LCS has according then rather than the LPL, I should say. But, um, you know, I, I don't know if he's the kind of guy that I would expect to take on some sort of dominant, like, core JJ level roaming support role uh, for this team. I know they've been hyping him up to be a very big roamer. I didn't see it, you know, watching his, his LPL games last year and even some of the LDL ones. I didn't see it. I saw some pretty standard plays and, and not too much outside of that. Not a lot of game losing errors either, though. Not a lot of things that would really say like, oh, no, I'm worried about him, you know, being this for the team. Just not necessarily someone who I think made a lot of the proactive plays. And I think the same can be said for Kuwaito, um, who, again, was just somebody who was a little bit more passive in his time in the LDL. Um wasn't someone that I would have necessarily like pinpointed and especially in some of the games that I scouted as like the guy to go and sign as uh, a North American team looking to import a young LDL player. But uh, clearly they see something in him in their internal scrims that they did uh, that that I'm not seeing. Um, I I'm not a huge fan of that pickup in general, uh, but I do think it's incredibly interesting. And, and the optics of, you know, tapping into the Chinese market that I think for a while, I think teams have just avoided because one of the big advantages NA has over other regions is the, their contracts. But one of the few regions that you don't really have that advantage over is China. Um, and so I think that market has been kind of just deemed to be avoided uh, by a lot of NA teams because, you know, what good Chinese player would want to come to NA if they can already get paid in China? I think we're seeing here that there definitely is a, a market for players like that to come over to NA. And if these two players work out, I definitely am going to, you know, expect a lot of teams to copy this and to, to kind of move on in the future from it. But uh, one player I haven't talked about yet is Tactical in the bottom lane coming over from Team Liquid. I'm a little bit lower on Tactical than I was, say, a year ago. But that's not to say that Tactical isn't still one of the better AD carries in North America. He absolutely is. And he is an upgrade here to Lost in the bottom lane. Um, I think he might struggle a little bit more on this team than he did on Team Liquid without the uh, support that he got uh, from, from players like Core JJ and from Santorin. Uh, I think Tactical was kind of allowed to be this team fight carry for that team. I think he's going to be relied upon a lot more this year to be lane dominant. Uh, maybe they're going to put Kaido in there. Um, I, I don't know. I don't exactly know what exactly their plan is. Everybody's going to be playing around Spica, that I can say for certain. But overall, a very intriguing direction that TSM went this offseason. And it'll be really interesting to see if it works out. Uh, really the first team to ever try something like this. That is going to take us to our final top six team from the 2021 season. And that is going to be Immortals. Now, Immortals was a team I had pegged as the worst team in the LCS last year. And that, they were not. They were not the worst team at LCS last year. In fact, 
they were a pretty competitive team in LCS last year, at least considering the roster that they had. And I think they made some pretty sizable upgrades to that roster this season. So let's go over uh, what they did. Their roster from top to bottom is looking like Revenge in the top lane, Xerxes in the jungle, Power of Evil in the mid lane, Wild Turtle at 80 carry, and then Destiny at support. Um, Revenge in the top lane. Uh, one of the few players that they kept, one of the three, I should say. And I'm not nearly as sold on Revenge as other people are. I was definitely not sold on him going into 2021. I think he did uh, a bit better than I expected, but but still wasn't some, some really, really solid top laner. I think he's good. I think you can start him on your team and not worry that he's going to int the game away. Uh, too hard, at least every week. Um, but I would have preferred them look in other directions here. Uh, I'm just not a huge fan of Revenge. And I think, uh, I don't like being negative here on the channel, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But uh, he has a lot to show me, and he absolutely has the mechanical skill to make that work. Uh, but uh, I, I need to see it at, at, at some sort of level uh, before I fully commit to him. Uh, Xerxes is someone that I am pretty high on, though, in the jungle here. Uh, Xerxes, I thought, had a really good year. Him and Destiny, as the support, I thought were the carries for this Immortals team uh, that kind of sparked their big end-of-the-year run last year. Um, he played really, really well, and I thought he had pretty good synergy here with uh, especially Destiny on those roams. There were a lot of global plays that this Immortals team would make that a lot of teams just couldn't match, and I thought it was really, really well done. Xerxes, uh, kind of known for multiple styles, I think took a little bit more of a carry style last year, and it worked out for this Immortals team. I expect to see that even more this year with the roster that's constructed around them. I think the change in the bottom lane definitely uh, puts more pressure on Xerxes to be that carry, but I think last year he proved that he does have the skill to be able to pull that off, and uh, it's going to be a little bit interesting to see how he does it. Destiny at the support is going to be similar as well. A lot of people were hating on Destiny after his small stint on Origin in the LEC, but coming over here to North America, a little bit of a worse uh, environment, I should say. A little bit, uh, the players aren't quite the same level as they are in the LEC. He looked pretty good. I think he kind of lived up to the promise that we got of him being a potential top three support in the West that I think Origin was really hyping him up to be when he came over originally. He was pretty good last year. Uh, he, he was a big reason, like I said, why this Immortals team was good, and I think his chemistry with Raze was, was really solid. Uh, I personally, and we'll get to the bot lane, I wouldn't have made this decision, but uh, I don't think it's uh, a huge wrong one from Immortals, especially from a PR perspective, but Destiny staying, I think, is a, a big win for this team. Him and Xerxes, both remaining on the team from last year, I think are big wins as they're both coming off of really, really solid seasons. But we then go ahead and get to talk about their two new additions, starting with Power of Evil PoE in the mid lane coming over from TSM to replace Insanity. This is just a straight upgrade. Um, Insanity plays with the grossest color balance I have ever seen. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, try and find Insanity's Pro View. It's got to be somewhere on YouTube. It is disgusting to look at. And I, for one, am glad that Power of Evil is now taking his spot. <laughs> All jokes aside, Insanity was okay last year. I don't think he was ever going to be some really, really good mid laner, though, in NA. I think Power of Evil is very consistently one of the better mid laners in North America. And I think coming over here to Immortals offers that safety presence that I think this roster didn't have last year. There was a lot of variance in players like Revenge and Raze. And I think Power of Evil offers you a lot more consistency, which is definitely what I think they are going for here. He is a very good laner. You know, someone who isn't necessarily ever going to make plays, but isn't really going to fall behind, is going to be focused on team fighting and playing those control mage style that 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 he is so famous for. Um, he, you know exactly what you're get what you're getting with power of evil, but in saying that, because you know exactly what you're getting, you can you can play around that and you can definitely make use of it, which I think this team is in a prime position to do. Their other big change was going from Rays last year to Wild Turtle in the bottom lane. Wild Turtle coming over from CLG after what was his worst year of his career. Uh, I don't think anyone is going to debate that. He had a bad year last year. He was not so good. Um, and that makes this change interesting to me. Obviously, Wild Turtle is a fan favorite, a former Immortals legend, 
part of that legendary Immortals original team with Huni and Rainover that uh, dominated NA for the period that they were in. Uh, he's not that player anymore. He's always been that more supportive style bot laner, that more team fight oriented resource non-dependent, independent? I don't know, how, how would you say that? He doesn't need resources. Um, whereas Raze, I think, is a little bit more high variance. I thought Raze actually had a pretty good season last year for this Immortals team, especially in lane. I thought his laning stats were really, really good. You know, you contribute a few of that to Destiny. I think Destiny had a really good year, but I think Raze was a little bit underrated in the grand scheme of things. Maybe he just wanted to return to Australia, or maybe this was a conscious decision. Either way, I'm not willing to call this a straight upgrade going from Raze to Wild Turtle. I was very close to labeling this as a downgrade personally, because if you're talking about 2021 Raze and 2021 Wild Turtle, I would much rather have 2021 Raze. But uh, CLG was a disaster last year. I can't expect Wild Turtle to be nearly as bad as he was on that train wreck of a team. I think many things were going wrong for that organization, and I expect him to have uh, at least a de at the very least a decent bounce back and to at the very least be comparable uh, maybe if if in a way a different way uh the same level of raise um you know raise more of that lane phase dominant wild turtle more of that late game dominant but uh the same level of impact uh, i'm i'm you know i think at the very worst we're probably going to get that out of wild turtle this year but overall for immortals i'm kind of pleasantly surprised with how they were able to go this offseason. Usually, organizations like Immortals don't tend to land high-profile free agents like Power of Evil and Wild Turtle. So it's really interesting to see them go all out for a roster that is pretty assuredly going to be a playoff team, but probably not too much more than that. Although, for those who are interested in comparisons, I think this team does have a lot of the makings of a team very similar, uh, at least in structure, uh, to a couple of years ago, and that was FlyQuest in 2020 that surprised everybody, finishing second in both the spring and the summer, and making Worlds. Uh, this has a little bit of a look of that. I don't think this team is necessarily as talented with as many of the same kind of core pieces, but, um, you know, never say never with a team like this. Um, if I had to guess, I think that they were going to be mid-table pretty assuredly, uh, somewhere between that 5 to 7 range. Uh, without too much variance, and you kind of know exactly what you're going to get every week playing them. But, you know, obviously they have room to surprise, and I'm just happy the organization is able to get some familiar faces in. Moving on to the team that actually finished sixth in the regular season, but couldn't end up beating Immortals in the playoffs when it counted, and that is going to be Dignitas. Um, Dignitas... Well, I've got some words about Dignitas. Uh, let's just go ahead and read off their roster first and foremost, and then I will get into what I want to say. In the top lane, they have Fate God. In the jungle is River coming over from PSG Talon. In the mid lane is going to be Blue coming over from SK Gaming in the LEC. Their bot laner is Neo, and their support is Biofrost coming out of, I don't want to say pseudo-retirement, but obviously not playing last year. So, Dignitas. Now... I tend to overall look at the positive side of things for the most part on this channel. You'll notice that with most of these reviews, I tend to lean towards, well, if things go right, then this is good. Um, and 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 I like to I like to look at things that way, but it is really, really tough for me to be positive about this Dignitas team and what they did this offseason. Last year they were NA through and through. They were the only team in the North American LCS with five endemic NA players, and that's awesome. You know, a lot of young players, obviously, players like Fake God in the top lane, players like Saligo, Yusui, Neo, they had a lot of young talent that was growing, and honestly, at the start, it looked like it was paying off. Um, this team was really, really good in spring. They fell off a little bit more in summer, but still, I, I, I mean, this team was... It, trending in the right direction with some young players that I think you could do something around. And they went and blew it up uh, and started importing players that I'm not super sold on. So let's talk about the two players that are returning. You got Fake God in the top lane and Neo in the bottom lane. I think if you were only going to return two young players, these were the two. 
Uh, Fake God, I thought, was the best player on this Dignitas team last year that wasn't named Aphromoo, which we will get to. But of the young players, I think Fake God was really good. I was singing Fake God's praises back in uh, last offseason. I was saying how it was absurd that this guy didn't have a team and that he was definitely LCS ready. And I think he proved that he was LCS ready. I think he is, to me, higher value than a player like Hooney. Um, and I think that might shock a lot of people, but I think Fake God's pretty good. Um, and I, I have no qualms about keeping him. I, for sure, if I was Dignitas, would have kept Fake God. And the same can be said for Neo in the bottom lane, where they, you know, Dignitas has this track record of taking a risk on younger endemic 80 carries. They did it with Johnson the year before, and this year they were doing it with Neo. And Neo, while not being the same kind of success that Johnson was, um, was still pretty good. I, I don't think Neo was a bad player at all. He had a really good spring and uh, kind of regressed in the summer. Uh, I, I don't exactly know what that was about entirely, but um, his summer was not the same level that his spring performance was. Uh, I still think it's definitely worth giving him a shot again. I think he's a good player that uh, has a chance to grow and, and, and was really starting to develop some chemistry. And, you know, the more time you get on the stage, you know, obviously with everything being so virtual and so weird last year, it's kind of hard to tell. You know, running running him back, I think, makes a lot of sense. Where I start to lose Dignitas is jungle mid, and I, I'm I'm not I'm not this guy who's like against importing players all the time. Obviously, I've made it quite clear in this episode already that I am pro endemic North American talent coming through the academy system. You know, m- giving these guys chances to succeed, but I, I'm not all I'm not at the same time anti import. What I am is anti-import for the sake of importing, which is exactly what it feels like Dignitas did this offseason. I'll talk about jungle first. Uh, They bring in River from PSG Talon, who I actually do think is a pretty solid player, and I think he's someone that is going to be pretty good in the LCS, but I don't know if I would be willing to give up an import slot for pretty good. Um, You know, he's an upgrade to Acadian, and I like Acadian. There's a lot of Acadian fans out there um, I, I, I like Acadian. I do think River is an upgrade to Acadian. I think he's going to be solid. I think in some ways he's a little bit underrated as a player going into 2022. But do I think that he's some high value, you know, carry level jungler? Probably not. You're Dignitas though. You're probably not going to be able to get a ton of those players out there. Uh, but then you look at the mid lane. They bring in Blue from SK Gaming in the LEC. And man, Blue was just awful last year. Uh, he was bad. He was really, really, really bad for SK. Blue was someone I had some hype coming into 2021 for. Uh, That did not pay off. He was not good. And I think a lot of teams would be willing to just say, okay, we're going to cut our losses. We're going to say it didn't work out. I'm not sure he can perform at that level. Uh, Dignitas goes ahead and uses an import slot on him. And this, I just, I can't wrap my head around. Uh, nothing against Blue as a player. Maybe he proves me entirely wrong. And maybe he is, you know, a good player, you know, at the LCS level. But it's, it's the process behind this that I just don't understand. You abandon your idea of growing some young NA talent. You had two really solid young NA mids, Saligo and Yusui, on roster uh, that played games for you last year. And you give up on both of them to import what was probably the worst mid laner in the LEC last year. And that, I just, I just don't get it. I, 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 process wise, I don't get it. Um, it's something that I, I can't get behind at, at, at any stretch. So while I can say river, you know, probably an upgrade to Acadian is, is a better player right now. Maybe not the caliber player you would really want is at least a better player right now. Blue, I'm not even sure is better than Sligo or Yusui right now. And he's taking up an import slot. I just, I'm not a fan of this decision at all. Uh, and, and, and I'm also not a fan of the support pickup. And that might surprise some people. I've been pretty pro Biofrost for, for quite a few years now. Um, but I, again, it's just, it seems like such a low ceiling pickup for Dignitas. I, I, I Obviously, the rumor was that they were negotiating with Zazel. And that fell through. I think Zazel would have been a better pickup here than Biofrost, excuse me. Um, but even so, I just, I don't know. I I think this is, this is, 
we this is a team that really really wants to get eighth and and, and I don't know if they're ever going to get more than that and that just seems like such a low value way to build your team that they they are by the way as of the time of recording which is the 12th of December 2021 they are the only team in the LCS that has yet to announce their academy roster as well. It just seems like this team doesn't have a direction. You know, obviously, if you're going to lose Aphromoo, you're going to lose Aphromoo. You obviously want to do everything you can to keep him because he was a huge glue piece for this team last year. But if you're going to lose him, you're going to lose him. But man, I just don't know if Biofrost is that same level of veteran leadership that someone like Aphromoo offers in a way where it, it it is worth it to have him over another young prospect. I would prefer someone like JJ, who was in their academy system last year, over Biofrost personally here, just to give him a chance. Um, I'm just It just seems like such a low ceiling uh, roster in general, and that's something I'm just not a huge fan of. So I hate being super negative here on this channel, but uh, I, I really don't have a ton of great things to say about how Dignitas went about this offseason. Moving on from someone that I'm a little bit more down on to a team that I am much higher on than I think a few other uh, pundits out there are, and that's going to be Golden Guardians. Um, Golden Guardians, I thought, had a really solid offseason, doing a lot of the things that I would have hoped a team from their position would do, which is invest in some younger talent while also maintaining some veteran presence on the roster. So talking about their 2022 roster, it's going to be Licorice in the top lane, Pride Stalker, in the jungle, a Blaze Olive in the mid lane lost as the AD carry, and then Ole as the support. I like this roster. Um, I actually think this is across the board a pretty nice upgrade from 2021. And uh, you know, I was pretty vocal about how I wasn't a huge fan of of the direction that they were going in 2021. Um, I I thought uh, the players that they had were fine. Um, I was a fan of Niles and Iconic. I was not a huge fan of Stixe and Chime. Um, and then a blaze, I think, turned uh, me as someone who was just kind of like, ah, he's meh, to like, okay, yeah, he can really play in the LCS. Um, and then they go and pick up Licorice right before the summer split or midway through the summer split. I don't actually remember which way. Uh, it was sometime in summer they go ahead and pick up Licorice from FlyQuest. And all of a sudden, this team's layout looks entirely different. Um, I am going to go ahead and talk about the players that are remaining. Let's talk about Licorice since I brought him up first and foremost. They acquired him last year from FlyQuest, and Licorice, while not being the player that he was on Cloud9 just a few years ago, is still one of the more consistent top laners in the LCS, and he proved that last year, really helping catapult this team into a position to make playoffs, when I don't think that was really their goal uh, last year. I think it was definitely uh, develop, uh, I think, solid for this team, and I think a lot of that has to do with how well Licorice played last year. He's a solid player, not one that's too unbelievable, but, but still pretty good. Uh, and then you've got a Blaze Olive coming back as the mid laner, someone who, like I said, I was I wasn't gonna say I was down on because a Blaze was someone who I hyped up uh, back in 2018 during the scouting ground circuit, uh, only to later kind of just say, well, he's had so much time in Academy and he's really done nothing with it. He hasn't been one of the better Academy mids or anything like that. Uh, I just don't think he's gonna be an LCS contributor. To last year, he really became an LCS contributor uh, for this Golden Guardians team. And I think that's really good. Um, I think he pleasantly surprised me, and I think he definitely earned his spot starting here as the mid laner in 2022. Uh, but talking about the additions, we'll talk about Pride Stalker in the jungle first. Now, this is a really interesting pickup. This to me is not at all similar to what Dignitas did bringing in Blue. I think while they're similar ages, I think Pride Stalker actually might be a bit older. Um, I think Pride Stalker has significantly more upside than someone like Blue does for Dignitas. I think Pride Stalker actually had a pretty good year for Mouse Esports, and I think he might come in as one of the better uh, surprising junglers um, in, uh, in 2022. Obviously, jungle being such a stacked role, it's hard for me to say that he's not even bottom two or bottom three in the region just because of how good jungle is in North America. But I still think he could surprise a lot of people and be a really positive contributor to this Golden Guardians team in year one. You're retaining Iconic as well, your jungler from last year, as your Academy jungler, which I think is good. If Pride Stalker does struggle, you can always flip those two. Iconic has experience playing in the LCS and in the playoffs, so uh, it's someone who, uh, you know, I, I think you could easily slot in for some games here or there if you need to. 
Um, the bottom lane, however, is kind of where my excitement starts for this team. I think the addition of Lost in the bottom lane is actually a really, really solid pickup here for Golden Guardians. I think Lost was actually a little bit overhated last year on TSM. We have to remember that team did finish first in the regular season, and while they did fizzle out getting fifth in the playoffs, I think Lost actually maybe got a little bit too much hate for his performances. I think Lost is a solid player, and I think he's a pretty consistently good starting LCS bottom laner. Um, obviously, Golden Guardians, I believe... One of the organizations that brought Lost in, I could be wrong, it, it, them and Echo Fox, I don't remember which one really had their hands on him first, but, um, you know, Golden Guardian's known for bringing in O's talent and really developing them, trying to get the best out of them. Uh, Lost, I think, is a good evolution of that. I think he's going to be really, really solid here for Golden Guardians. You're pairing him up with Ole in the bottom lane, or as the support, who, uh, of course, did not play, similar to Biofrost in 2021. However, I'm a little bit higher on Ole because during Ole's time off, he did hit, I believe it was rank three on the Korean solo queue ladder, which is an accomplishment that I don't think a lot of people would be able to say. That is that is pretty big. Um, he was playing somewhere of like 14 games a day, staying on the grind. He went into game development for a little bit. You know, just a really motivated guy and someone who we've seen have you know, good success here in the past. I gave him the exact same grade as I gave Biofrost a C minus. However, I'm a little bit more confident in saying that Ole is going to be an immediate contributor than someone like Biofrost would be on Dignitas. If you notice, I'm comparing the two a lot because I think these two actually had similar starting points this offseason that both went in drastically different directions. So overall, I think the upgrade from Stix8 and Chime to Lost and Ole is quite large. I think Stix8 and Chime was very obviously the worst bottom lane in LCS last year. And I think Lost and Ole is maybe one that's going to surprise a few people this year, uh, especially Lost. I think he's going to really emerge as one of the better laning AD carries. And he's also a really, really solid team fighting AD carry as well. So I think a lot of his performances might shock some people this year. Um, and I think Golden Guardians might have some shocking games this year. Uh, I'm not necessarily willing to say that this team is like really, really good or even top six or anything like that. But you know, I think there's a chance that this team surprises a lot of people kind of bouncing on that top six line uh, for most of the year. I think a lot of that's going to hinge on how well Licorice and Lost play, their two main carries, and whether a Blaze Olive and Pride Stalker can take that next step uh, up to what we believe that they could be. Um, either way, I, I do like the direction that the Golden, that the Golden Guardians went in uh, this offseason, and uh, I'm really excited to see them play whenever we actually get games. That's going to go ahead and bring us to our first of two non-playoff teams from summer last year, the first of which being FlyQuest. FlyQuest, of course, last year going from back-to-back -back finals in spring and summer in 2020 to in 2021 being the ninth place team, second from last in the LCS. Unfortunately, quite the drop-off, but they did go ahead and do some cool things with their roster this offseason, so I'll go over the 2022 roster, which is going to be Kumo in the top lane, Jose Deodo in the jungle, Takuya, which I believe is how you say it in the mid lane, Johnson at AD carry, and then Aframu at support. Um, we'll talk about Kumo first here. Uh, at what point are we going to admit that Kumo just isn't that good? And I don't mean that in a, in a terrible way. I don't think he's like abhorrently bad. I just, again, another guy who I think was, was really hyped up coming out of the academy scene, um, played really, really well for Cloud9 Academy back in the day was sold off to EG, didn't play super well for EG, ended up at FlyQuest Academy, played meh in Academy for FlyQuest, got promoted last year when everyone and their mom was doing the roster shuffles, uh, you know, with FlyQuest basically playing with 10, 11, 12-man roster. Uh, Kumo got his chance up on the main roster, and I just, I, I still wasn't sold. I, 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 I'm not, I'm just, I'm not a believer that Kumo can really become anything other than like a bottom three top laner in NA. And I, I think that's fine. I don't think that absolutely destroys FlyQuest chances this year, but I would have liked to see them go in another direction. Um, moving on to jungle, they retain Jose Deodo, which I'm fine with. Jose has a gigantic fan base. And, you know, if, if you're a fan of Jose Deodo, a Latin American viewer that, that may be a huge fan, uh, I, I don't have anything terribly bad to say about Jose. I don't think he's particularly, like, dominant yet, or at least he hasn't shown it. Uh, what I am curious about is the uh, the non-re-signing of NXI, which I thought was quite curious. 
NXI obviously played a little bit in LCS last year, but was mostly the Academy jungler for FlyQuest, who I think is a really, really solid player. Um, and he seems to not have an Academy team, as far as I'm aware this year, which I think is a shame. Um, I think I would probably rate NXI a little bit higher than Jose Deodo, personally. Uh, but Jose's not a bad player. I think Jose's fine. Um, you know, it, it, he, he was kind of that carry style jungler, that outlandish carry jungler in Latin America. Uh, he hasn't really pulled it off yet here in North America, probably because a lot of the talent around him really wasn't up to snuff. That might be a little bit different this year. He actually could be a candidate for someone that overperforms a little bit. Uh, just with the talent around him, I think that is definitely a possibility. The final uh, returning member of this FlyQuest team is going to be Johnson in the bottom lane. Uh, now, Johnson, you know, obviously coming off of some really, really good rookie year, some really, really good rookie year, a really, really good rookie year with Dignitas in 2020, comes over to FlyQuest in 2021 and takes a little bit of a step back, was still pretty good. Um, I, I think a lot of people underrate how good jo uh, Johnson actually was, especially in lane. In 2021, he was still one of the better laning AD carries in the entire league, even with all the turnover that FlyQuest was having. It was transitioning those leads into anything meaningful late game that I think he struggled with. But I think a lot of those fears might be alleviated because he's getting his Dignitas support back, the one he had such great synergy with in 2020, and that is Aphromoo. Aphromoo coming off of what was a very good year for Dignitas, being easily their best player and a big reason why they finished top six in the regular season. Um, I think this bottom lane is prime to be exactly where they left off in 2020, which is sneakily one of the better bottom lanes in all of North America. Um, I expect this to be a very lane dominant bottom lane, and Aphromoo I think is one of the better supports at uh, helping his AD carries transition that into a late game. He's great at peel, he's great at engage, he's just great at team fighting. I think that duo is really, really going to help FlyQuest and is going to be a big focal point for how well this team performs in 2022. And then, of course, you're bringing in Takoya uh, in the mid lane, which is super sweet. Uh, obviously, Takoya, sixth place uh, European Regional League mid laner. Oh, the memes. You take a sixth place European Regional League mid laner over NA talent. What we're leaving out of that equation is that he was the MVP of the French Regional League, which you could make a really strong case is the strongest regional league um, you know, maybe even stronger than a lot of the wildcard regions in the world. So, um, Takuya is a really, really interesting player, incredibly young, and I'm, I'm really interested to just see how he does. I think it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, an adjustment period. Um, I think his play style, you know, he, he's more ostentatious, and I think that can work on this team. Uh, him and Deodo, I think him and Jose are, are going to make a really, really interesting pairing, and I'm really intriguing. I'm really intrigued to see how that works out. Um, we're going to see if they want to give him resources, if they want to give Johnson resources. Uh, I think this team actually does have a lot of options. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure they're, like, top in terms of, uh, like, mechanics in the, in, the, in the league or anything like that, but I, I actually really like the way this team is constructed, and I think this could be a team that could win on any given day. Um, of course, you're retaining the Academy bot lane as well, I wanted to point out here, of Tomo and Diamond, who I both think are good players. Uh, just a quick note to put in there, but I, I, I like what FlyQuest did this offseason. Uh, definitely not something that I would consider uh, ordinary. I think this was kind of a unique offseason for FlyQuest, but overall, I, I, I would say that I'm okay with it. Outside of a few decisions, I think that I would consider FlyQuest's offseason a success. That finally leads us into our 10th place, our worst team from 2021. And anybody who watched the LCS in 2021 knows that the worst team was CLG Counter Logic Gaming. They went 12 and 33. They were atrocious in 2021. And to reconcile that, they actually replaced all five members of their roster. They are the only team, as far as I'm aware, in any Western or in either of the Western leagues, to do so. Their 2022 roster looking like Jenkins in the top lane, Contracts in the jungle, Palafox in the mid lane, Luger at AD carry, and Poom at support. I'm actually really, really into this roster. Now, uh, if anyone follows me on Twitter, y'all know that I am a part of the hipster 
uh, group of <laughs> LCS fans that I think has now been coined. It's 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 the it's hipster to like this CLG roster because oh, I watch Academy, and I, if you watch Academy, you're hipster, I guess. But that's where we're at. So. I do like this roster. I think they have a lot of interesting pieces, some pieces that have experience in LCS. I believe only one player on this team has never played an LCS game. So it's not like these are complete unknowns to the LCS, but uh, it's definitely interesting. Uh, we'll talk about, we'll talk about the, we'll go top to bottom. How about that? We'll just talk about top to bottom first. So we'll talk about Jenkins first coming over from Team Liquid Academy. He played a few games for Team Liquid last year in place of Alfari. Um, Jenkins was actually really, really good in Academy. Um, this is a guy who's been in the academy scene for, for quite a while, uh, but hasn't really ever stood out. Last year was a different story. He was really, really solid for that Team Liquid Academy team. A big reason why his call-up felt so important was because of how well he was playing. It felt like he was being rewarded for good play rather than uh, Alfari being punished for bad play. Not saying that decision was the right one, just saying, you know, Jenkins, I think, looked really, really good, and I think this is a very good pickup for CLG. Obviously, he doesn't have necessarily the track record to say that he's going to be some beast LCS top laner, but um, if you're just going based off of last year, I think that could definitely be the case. Uh, jungle, for them, is going to be Contracts. Uh, Contracts is a fan favorite, someone who I have actually, I don't want to say I've put down in the past, but someone who I haven't been as high on in the past, just because I think he offers a little bit more of that feast or famine jungle style that we just don't see that often in Pro League of Legends anymore. But with that coming back into relevance, I think with this year, uh, the jungle changes, I think very much favor aggressive plays like that. I think Contracts could very much be a sneaky contender for really, really solid jungler this year. Uh, I say like that's an award, but uh, I think Contracts could actually have a pretty solid year. Uh, he was really dominant for EG Academy last year. Enough so where he started to take some starting time off of Svenskeren, if you're noticing a trend. I think he is the best player on this team, and I think he's going to be the one who gets a lot of the resources. Uh, him and bottom lane, I think, are going to be the resource-heavy lanes. Uh, but Contracts, I think, is a huge upgrade to Broxa, who was just more of that passive style, could really only win on some certain picks last year. I'm, I'm not saying Broxa's a bad player, just everything went wrong on CLG last year. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. I don't want to label all these players that were on CLG as bad players because I think, again, you know, disaster of a situation. But um, I think Contracts is going to be an upgrade to Broxa purely from just how proactive Contracts is. Uh, moving on to Palafox in the mid lane. He was the starting mid laner for FlyQuest last year for a majority of the year. Obviously, him and Triple split some time towards the end of the year, but uh, you bring him in, Palafox obviously being an Academy darling for many years past for Cloud9. Uh, I believe Optic Gaming before that. I could be wrong, but I believe he was on Optic Gaming Academy before that, and then Cloud9 Academy gets signed by FlyQuest to be their starting mid laner. Um, he played fine last year. I don't think he was like particularly bad. I don't think he was particularly good. Um, I just think he was fine. I think this is a situation where he might have a little bit more agency. Because uh, I think the resources are pretty up for grabs on the CLG team. I think whoever wants those resources are going to have them. And I think draft is really going to be important for this team. I think him coming in, uh, he's not as young as you would want your young guns to be. But he still is decently inexperienced. And I think he's a really solid pickup here. As is the bottom lane, which both come in from 100 Thieves Academy. And that's going to be Luger and Poom. Luger, of course, formerly of Fenerbahce in the TCL. Poom, formerly of actual 100 Thieves in the LCS. Um, this is incredibly cool to see these two get brought up together for CLG. I really hope this bot lane's good because they were pretty good in Academy last year. Luger especially was dominant as an 80 carry in Academy last year. One of the better players in Academy. I think Poom's a good player as well, but Luger is really, really solid. Um, I like the idea of keeping these two together. They showed a lot of synergy and they, they clearly grew and got better as the season progressed for that 100 Academy team. Um, I, I'm just a fan of where the CLG roster is. Um, this is, you know, exactly what I would do in a situation like this. If I'm CLG and I'm aware that I can't land, you know, big name talent because I'm CLG and I have a history of losing and, you know, I just came off a split where I went 12 and 33. I'm going to invest in young talent. I'm going to say, okay, well... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna throw some darts at some young NA talent, and if we hit, we could really be looking at a team that you know contends, you know, for for top six somewhere around there. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say I'm expecting them to do that, but 
you know, if this team hits, they, they could actually be really, really solid. Um, and, you know, for NA's sake, I hope teams like this do continue to succeed because anything that promotes the development of NA Academy and amateur and young NA talent, I am all for. What with everything that's happened with Five Fire and value uh, over the last few weeks, uh, you know, anything that shows organizations that, yes, you can invest in young North American talent, you can invest in them and they will pay off for you rather than just, oh, who's the big name free agent this year to sign? I, for that reason alone, I hope the CLG team does well. Um, am I projecting that to happen? Maybe not, but, uh, you know, for, for, for the future of NA's sake, I do hope that this team can surprise a lot of people. And that's going to wrap it up. That is all 10 teams done. We did it. All 10 uh, explained, off seasons analyzed, reviewized, and donezo. If you guys are here for power rankings, you're going to have to wait a little bit. I'm going to release those a lot closer to the start of the actual season. I'm at the very least going to wait until after the lock in tournament to make those videos. If you guys like this, though, please go ahead and leave a like and a comment. If you have any options or ideas as to how to make this sort of series better, or if you have any different opinions to me, I always love chatting it up with you guys down in the comment section below. If you guys really want an LEC version of this video, it is going to be in the works. Go ahead and let me know that down in the comment section as well. Well then, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope to see you all soon, and I will see you all later.